All right, guys, I thought I'd give you an update on this project. Uh, other than growth and the building of a manifold, not a lot has happened. I am well behind where I expected to be this time of year. But that blazing freaking sun up there is just killing me, man. And, uh, I mean, I I've actually considered it outright uh, unsafe working conditions. I had a dehydration event a few weeks ago, and then I went on vacation for 10 days. Uh, and uh, I'm being really, really careful uh, with how much work I do out in this heat. And... Uh, First week back from vacation, man. I, I simply just didn't get up early enough to, to start working before I got on my podcast. Anyway, um, you can see that uh, growth is extreme. Uh, I put salvinia and duckweed in the main tank, and duckweed uh, really likes it uh, and is uh, doing well in here. So this duckweed is now feeding my koi. I come in here every day and take a scoop of this stuff and uh, bring it over to the koi. The only thing living in here right now is minnows, and uh, we did use BT dunks in there because the minnows may not be able to, at their population level, keep the mosquitoes down. Uh, the the uh, Korean water celery, it looked pretty sad when I put it in there, has really taken off. I got some cattail in there, basically because I have no other place for it right now, it's dwarf cattail. You can see they're kind of cool. Uh, these ones have their little cattail heads, and that's exactly, it's just a small version of cattail. Uh, really cool stuff. It's actually a really popular water po uh, pond plant, backyard pond plant, because it's scaled down. That's not something we could do divisions with and sell to a, a bunch of yuppies, you know. Um, here's the manifold. I cannot take credit for this. Nick Ferguson with Homegrown Liberty was here, and um, I needed some stuff done, and I thought, you know, hey, I'd rather pay him to do it, because I know he'll do it right and get it done, uh, than not pay somebody to do it. So I asked him to do this. And he came up with a pretty cool little manifold here. And I talked about this before, so I'll try to make sense of what's going on. Um, what we did, we put a cross in here. This is the basic stuff, and this is what I had come up with. And we're going to send two one inches this way and two one inches this way. And you can see there's a deep hole here, and we've got the crossing of the one inch over the two inch. We can dig a deep hole here. There's some kind of a natural depression here in the rock where we can get in here. Just worked out perfectly. We'll put a service box over this so we can work it. But that trench there, see it going that way? That's as deep as it'll get. And if I try to cross one and two inch pipe in that trench, so when we, when we get that piped, it'll be a one inch and a one inch with a two inch in between. If we have to cross down here, because when we get down here, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a two inch and a one inch going to that bed. But there's gonna be another bed right here. So that pipe's gonna tee off and there's gonna be a two inch and a one inch going this way. Well, if we didn't run those double, and it's only a little extra pipe and a couple fittings, that double one inch, we'd have to cross here where we can only dig, you know, just about two and a half inches deep and barely cover the two inch pipe. So by running the double one inch, we just made it where when we come down to here, we can tee the two and a 90 on the one and a 90 on the one on the other side and we're good. The cool part Nick came up with, and it looks kind of confusing until you understand what's going on here, is he built this manifold. I'm trying not to fall in the hole here. And the way this works is, here's your return, and here's your pressurized side, your delivery side. And again, there'll be a piece of one inch pipe coming out of there and there. Down here, this just lets us open either one of those sides to a drain, including both of them. So in the winter, when we're gonna have a freeze, we can simply shut off the deliveries to all the beds, shut off the delivery out of the pond, and uh, open all of these valves. And if you open all these valves the way they're now, on this side, everything will drain out and nothing's there to break and freeze. However, if we close off the supply side on the delivery end and uh, just use the pump pressure, now we can route the pressurized water into the return line and push water through the return line. Well, why would we want to do that? Return lines tend to clog over time. You end up having to blow them out, snake them out. By doing that, we can actually blow water through and we can cap, we'll have eight of them, so we can cap seven at a time and blow each one completely out if we needed to. Probably just blowing the whole thing out once in a while will prevent clogs, so that's cool. Other news, um, the Evan Flow beds are happy. Remember, this is fishless aquaponics base. There's some minnows in there, they're not doing nothing. I just dumped in some garret juice and some liquid kelp and a little bit of fish uh, emulsion. So the basil's really, really happy. Uh, this is a tomatillo, a little plant I had, I just stuck in here, it's doing really good. Got some peppers uh, doing okay. Cucumber looking pretty good. 
Wario greens, they seem a lot happier now that the basil grew in. They're, they're really getting baked in this heat. It's too hot for them. Uh, but I think now they're doing a lot better. A little tomato, this is just some tomato clones that we threw in. Green onions like always. But this is the big story, man. This Armenian snake melon. Here's, here's the one set here. These taste just like cucumber. We'll let that grow one more day. It'll probably grow another third in size. We're gonna use this to make some cucumber salsa. It'll actually be Armenian snake uh, melon salsa for the family tomorrow for the 4th of July. But look at this. This is, I mean, this plant was only put in here like 25 days ago. It's one plant. This is the power of aquaponics, specifically ebb and flow for certain plants. Look at this. This is insane. Anyway, so, got too late to start today to really work. Tomorrow's the day off. This week, what I hope to do is get, by the end of the weekend, get these two plumbed in, get the gravel layer down, start getting them filled up so we can plant these, and uh, start at least laying out the trench work and the block work to do two more which are going to be right in this area right here uh if that gets me four beds up by the end of july i still got a lot of growing season left ahead of me and we can get a lot done and then we still have four more to get in at least i'd like to fit 10 in this area but i don't know if it's practical um and then i have some pretty cool plumbing that's going to be going along with this uh this has to be plumbed uh, you're your uh, sump, which is your lowest point in the system, should have a float valve plumbed into a you know, water source if you can do it. Uh, this has to be. To run beds like this off of a 300 gallon tank, it has to happen. Uh, there's just not enough battery there to do it without it, which is great because there'll always be a fresh flow of water and again, I have well water so I can do that. Uh, I've been concerned about using a standard float valve for uh, a stock tank because this is something you guys have to think about with float valves and people don't think about this. You got to think about this is like a tidal system and you got high tide and low tide and low tide is when the maximum amount of water when just the, the world of pumps and plumbing sync up to where all of your ebb and flow or most of your ebb and flow is relatively full at the same time maximum amount of water out of here these tanks even with the rock displacing water and probably hold uh, I'd say 25 to 30 gallons a piece, call 25. If they're both near full at the same time, it's 50 gallons of water. We have a 300 gallon tank. You know, that's, that's a significant portion, but we're really more like 250 gallons of capacity in here because we have displacement from the rocks uh, and what have you, and we're not filling all the way to the top because we don't want to create overflow events, okay? So with that, we have 250 gallons. So that's one fifth, one fifth of all the water can be out at any one time. There's your low tide. That's your, you know, you have different types of low, sometimes low tides, a moderate low tide, sometimes a big low tide. So that's your big low tide. And then sometimes when that happens, you get a complete dump of both sides at the same time. Now you get a high tide. So you get 50 gallons of fluctuation in here. That's before we tie these guys in and they start wicking away water every day and they'll probably use, you know, 20 gallons of water a day will need to be added to the system. But if we put a float valve in and it holds the water too high, when we get that low tide, the float valve is going to kick in and it's going to dump water in and fill it up almost to low, high tide level. When we get a real high tide, we're going to overflow the system. And we're going to be constantly kicking water out of the system and that's not what we want to do at all. That's wasting water. So what we need is we need to figure out the sweet spot and hold the water level low enough that we can maintain that low level, but yet when we add water at that low level and we get a high tide, so to say, during you know when that water gets filled during a low tide, uh, we don't overflow and because the stock tank float valves are really designed just to keep these things full for cattle to drink out of them I've been worried about how deep they can go I figured out how to adjust them and how I can adjust them even more than they're designed to adjust so that's kind of my next thing to do as soon as these guys are plumbed in I want to get a float valve in and remember I got pressurized water right there so that's that's stubbed up and ready to go we want to plumb that in one real important thing that I've come up and figured out. I tested one of these flow valve systems yesterday. You need to do it with pipe underground as much as possible and only tie in the last little bit with hose so you make your own little leader hose and that needs to be shaded protected from the sun. Why? Because you're trickling water through that hose. Like when that goes down that float valve kicks on and water starts going in there. Okay how much is going to go in there? Half a gallon and it's going to fill up and it's going to stop because it's all day long. Every time that float valve dips, 
it fills up. It dips and fills up. Okay. If that hose is sitting in the sun in the summer, all day long, and only a quarter, a half a gallon at a shot is coming out of it, what's the temperature of the water you're putting into your system? 100, 120 degrees or more? That, that can't be. So we've got to protect the delivery system from direct sunlight or we're going to overheat the water. Now, we might actually think of a second way to use that factor, maybe even run through a solar heater during the winter, and we could actually warm the water and keep it above freezing. And I've got some ideas for that in here. That might end up going up on that uh, roof. And we'll have a thermal switch that'll know when the water temperature goes below a certain temperature, start pumping it up there before it goes into the system. Or even just have one recirculating component or a timer that pumps a certain amount up. And when it gets a certain temperature on the top, drops it down. There's a lot of ways we can do that. There's a guy named Sean Mills that talked about this at Nicole uh, Sauce's workshop. I'm gonna talk to him soon about how to do that. But right now, the last thing I'm worried about is freezing. I would kill for some freezing weather right now. Anyway, that's where we're at. I know it doesn't look like a huge amount of progress, but uh, it'll move a lot faster from here. Again, thanks to Nick Ferguson from Homegrown Liberty that built that manifold for me and came up with that backflow. And uh, let me throw this out as a like a you know like a, a piece for him. Uh, if you're thinking about building systems, I don't care if they're aquaponics, permaculture, just setting up a homestead. He does consulting specifically in the South Central United States, like Texas, Louisiana, and there. But he'll go anywhere for you know if you pay the travel fees. Um, He's worth his weight in gold. Uh, I gave him some cash to do this, what I thought the job was worth. That's what he added. That's now gonna get integrated into every system that I build and my buddy David builds from here on out. We will always put a backflow uh, manifold in because it's so valuable. What did that save me by giving him a couple hundred bucks to do this job for me? A lot. Over time, thousands of dollars. And he's good at finding mistakes. So check him out. He's at homegrownliberty.com. His name's Nick Ferguson. Uh, I get questions all the time about doing consulting. I don't do consulting. I hate doing consulting. Call Nick. He'll hook you up. And with that, guys, we'll catch up with you later.